Thanks for joining us tonight, everyone. I am April Eide with the New Ulm Public Library. Um, tonight we have a presentation from Minnesota author Mark Mitten. Um, tonight he'll discuss his books and his Western fiction writing. He's the author of Sipping Whiskey in a Shallow Grave, which was nominated for a 2013 Peacemaker Award. Mark's follow-up novel, Hard to Quit, was published in September 2017. Copies of Mark's books will be available for sale and signing after his presentation. Please join me in welcoming Mark Mitten. Right. Thank you, April. Appreciate it. And thanks for the invitation, too. Well, yeah, my name is Mark, and I live about an hour north of here in Winstead. I don't know if you guys have traveled up there, but it's a small little ag town, too. And um, I've been living there for about five years. And prior to that, I was in Colorado for most of my life, so I have a, uh, a great deal of personal connection to the West, and that's where my heart is. And I'm sure uh, if any of you have been exposed to the Western world or the, the West at all, you probably have a place in your heart, too, for it. Uh, yeah, I wrote two books uh, over the past um, uh, six or seven years, I guess. Uh, they're both historical fiction, and my niche would be Colorado history and the West. So both of my books take place in the late 1800s in Colorado in the mountains. Who here has been out in that area? Road trips, family vacations, anything like that? Okay, good. So you can probably visualize pretty easily uh, the topography and the terrain. And uh, that's kind of why I try and capture two in the book. You know, you're going to read about mountains and mountain towns. And if you ever drive through Colorado, you'll probably encounter some of these actual places. So even if you go on a uh, you know, just a vacation, and you're like, hey, I'm going to drive up the mountains, and you may go through some of these towns, and you'll be like, hey, I just read about this. Um, when you do go through Colorado and the high country, I've always seen this, and, and I'm sure if you've been there, you've seen it too. Uh, a lot of the architecture in these small mountain towns seems to, uh, it's like they've taken pride on hanging on to the west in the architecture. You see a lot of Victorian homes and coloring, you know, places like uh, Leadville, Ure, Telluride, all the big places, as well as the smaller towns you may not have heard of. Uh, they all have a lot of um, Western history almost right in front of your face. You know, there's buildings with all the old flagstones and dates, kind of like out here, too, when you're driving up and down uh, Broadway. I just noticed that tonight there's some older buildings, and it's uh, probably a very similar thing. The, the history is almost alive in the architecture. And I, for me, as a writer, that's inspiring, and that's kind of kind of what uh, caught my attention when I was writing. Uh, it's easy in fiction, for me at least, to uh, to just write whatever you want. But when you're writing historical fiction, it was my goal to try and ground it in a little bit of reality every time I picked up the pen, so to speak, or in my case, you know, the laptop. Uh, I was going to tell you first about sipping whiskey in a shallow grave. Um, April here has been kind enough to carry these both books in the library here. Hard to Quit is the one that just came out, so this is book number two, sequel, but it's also, uh, you could read this uh, as a standalone novel and be just fine. Uh, but I do take a couple of the characters from Sipping Whiskey to a new place here a few years later in the timeline. So there is a connection there with some, uh, some of the characters. So Sipping Whiskey in a Shallow Grave um, is set in 1887. Um, who here's uh, read Western? We got some Western fans. Yay or nay? Yeah, yeah. I know you are, Jim. Okay. Yep. Good. So I don't know if you're familiar with some of the authors. I know there's a lot of them out there. I haven't heard of half of them, but there's some big names. Obviously, Louis L'Amour, uh, Cormac McCarthy, and Larry McMurtry was always one of my biggest inspirations. I don't know if you've read Lonesome Dove. Excellent book. Oh, Elmer Kelton, that's right. Yeah, in fact, yeah, there's been the Justified show. I watched that a few years ago. That was based off of one of his uh, short um, stories, too. But yeah, a lot of good novelists. Um, on the spectrum, I'd say I would probably land more on the McMurtry side of things. So I've got uh, more of a less of, less of a simplistic good guy, bad guy scenario like a Louis L'Amour and more of a, a you know life arc with some of my characters where the narratives kind of go in and out and you get to know one character and you get to know another and their lives connect and sometimes they go apart. There's dramatic moments, there's tense moments, and there's also some comic moments. So there's, uh, I try and give it a lot of uh, humanity, I guess is the word. In Sipping Whiskey, which is the first one, I have a basic story of three groups of people. Um, there's some bank robbers, 
who get caught, and there's a there's a escape from jail that sets the whole thing off. So there's a jailbreak, and then there's the posse that goes after them. So the local uh, the local law says, hey, let's go get these guys, and then you have some cowboys who just happen to be moving some cattle from their summer uh, pasture down to Denver to ship them off to Wyoming is the plan. And as they're moving their horses through the mountains, they're moving down an old stage road. And that's when a lot of these storylines kind of converge and then things kind of uh, go south from there. And then uh, and that's, really, that's really the first part of the book. And the second half is kind of following the, follow out, uh, the, the fallout as the characters deal with um, you know, their personal struggles. They're the good, the bad, and the ugly as it, as it unfolds. I thought I'd go ahead and read just a chapter two out of, uh, out of this one and let you guys kind of get a feel for, uh, for the story and, the, and my writing style. And I know uh, the books were out, and I think we had, I think you might have got a head start on me, but I'm going to read it anyways. Ooh, all right. <laughs> She's read chapter one. Uh, let's see. Grab this water real quick. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and read. Uh, and, the, and the chapters are all kind of short, so they're not like super extensive, which is kind of fun. You kind of get, a, you get into it and get to know someone, and then you start to know another character, and then their lives, like I said, start to come in and out. So chapter one is about... Um, well, I'll let you see as we go. Chapter one is Colorado, the Continental Divide in April, 1887. Griff shivered. He knew Emerson wasn't happy about all this. On one hand, the snow gave them hoof prints to follow. Tracking bank jackers in the backcountry was tougher when the ground was just pine needles and dirt. They already had one tied to the pack mule, at least something to show for it all. On the other hand, by the time they made it back to Grand Lake and dumped them in the jailhouse, the snow might melt down and tracking would be unprofitable. There was a groan from the direction of the pack mule. The prisoner was face down across the animal's back, and a long string of slobber trailed from his mouth. It had dribbled and frozen down the mule's side. Well, Dern, Em, Griff said with a glance to the sky, maybe we should head on back then. The sky was a gray ceiling right over the treetops. Looking up at it, the lanky, dark pines seemed to be pointing out the problem. Snow tufts were just starting to float around them. Big white flakes, light as the air. Either somebody spilt a sack full of cotton, Griff went on, or else that's snowing. Emerson Greer never looked up at the sky once. He knew the sun was gone and the clouds were low and the snow was in the air. He also knew it was better to head back. He just wanted to give the chase a fair shake. No, I winged one, Emerson said quietly. Got his arm pretty good. In addition to the horse tracks, Emerson kept noting drips of cherry red blood, not hard to see in the snow, but hard to see in the dark, and it was almost dark, and the temperature was dropping pretty quick. Even the stalwart Emerson Greer wasn't immune to the cold. He was wearing his heavy winter coat, thick woolly gloves. His hat kept the snow off his neck. He looked back at Griff. Shoot, let's call it. They were up near tree line. The forest was thinning out. The tracks led upslope onto the talus, and Emerson didn't want to head up into the open rocks in the dark. Horseback, it was slow going in such difficult terrain. Snowy rocks meant slickery footing, and a horse with a twisted hawk would be a chore. Emerson stopped his horse and sighed. He hated turning back. The sun would be out tomorrow and melt most of this off. Tracks would melt out too, but he couldn't do anything more about that. They, were, they weren't provisioned for a long haul, plus they had one of them anyway. Those coyotes are probably making for Kinsey City. Maybe they will, Griff agreed, get collared by the very men they stole from. Emerson Greer was a Grand County Sheriff. While Griff was his deputy and friend, there was still an etiquette to decision making. Griff knew five miles back the pursuit wasn't likely to pan out. Since Emerson shot one of them in the arm, the men were likely the men they were chasing were burdened with a wounded man and were likely heading for a safe place to hold up. Their tracks seemed to indicate that too. However many there were, four or five perhaps, they were headed in a crow's line and weren't taking any breaks. Well then, Griff nodded. He turned his horse and started back. The pack mule's lead line was tied to his own saddle. The mule was responsive and followed without any nipping or pulling. He was a good mule. Kodiak was his name. Some trapper from up north sold him to Griff a couple years back. 
It was anybody's guess why he got that name. He wasn't mean, and Kodiak was, sure, was sure-footed and confident on any trail. On occasion, Griff's wife, Bonnie, made carrot cakes. Griff inwardly wished those occasions were far more infrequent. Bonnie wasn't a good cook, especially when it came to sweets. Her most tasteless enterprise was her carrot cake, but Kodiak liked them. Griff always made sure to smuggle several slices out to the barn whenever Bonnie was out visiting. Made it disappear from the pantry quicker. Untie me, you fools. Griff glanced over his shoulder and smiled. Sure thing, boss, he said with a wink to Emerson. The sheriff stepped his horse up to the, by the mule. What's your name, Emerson asked. Bill, Bill said. He slurped a bit. His chin was cold since frozen spit was caked all over it. Bill twisted as best he could, but the best he could see was Emerson's tapadero. My head hurts, Bill went on. Where's my hat? It's quite cold and there's snow in my hair. Long gone, amigo. Their horses slowly plodded on. The light was fading fast now and it was getting hard to see through the trees very far. My head hurts, Bill went on. I'm not surprised none, Emerson replied. Buffalo, do you square on? You tied me to a godforsaken mule. That's thoughtless. Don't know how salty that mule is, Emerson said without much conviction. Hope she don't roll. Bill twisted again to throw a look at him, look up at him, but still he could only make out the tapadero. Damn you, rather inhumane, I'd say, Bill muttered. He relaxed and hung his head tiredly. He was not lying. His head was hurting. In fact, Emerson had hit him hard with the barrel of his 45 so hard that it split the skin and knocked Bill's lights out. Emerson leaned over and pressed his finger into Bill's torn scalp. Bill winced and jerked around violently, but the knots were well tied and he didn't go anywhere. Curse me again, and I'll crack your skull again. Best to just lay there and make do, Griff suggested. So that's chapter one. I'll just read the back of the book, too, to give you an idea where it's going. It's 1887, snow's falling in the high country of Colorado. Bill Ewing, who we just met, led a bank heist in the small mountain town of Kinsey City, but just woke up tied to the back of a mule. Sipping whiskey in a shallow grave is an epic novel chronicling Bill's gang of thieves, the posse that takes after them, and the cowhands of the Bee Cross Sea, and the unexpected turns of life which bring them all together. So we'll meet some cowboys here further on, too. Um, so let me flip over there and just give you a couple paragraphs of that. A few of the cows were just starting to stir in the dim morning light. They rose up and started to root through the snow to get at the cold grass, but most were still bedded down. Casey Pruitt rode slowly around the herd. He had given up trying to whistle a long time ago. His lips were too cracked. He was huddled inside an old yellow slicker with two sweaters layered up underneath for added warmth. Casey reached up and pulled his wide brim hat even lower onto his head. It was frosted over. Then he readjusted a knit scarf that was wrapped around his ears and chin. It had been a long night and he was more than ready for the sun to come up over the ridge. Up and down the valley, patches of spring grass had managed to poke up through the white crust. It wasn't much yet, but it was coming in. The season had begun. High summer grays, Casey muttered, and I'm freezing my cantle. As he made his way slowly around the herd, Casey's uh, dog limped over to the creek and sniffed the ice. The dog was close to 100 pounds and had a coat so thick the winter air didn't get through. Casey called him Hopper. He had a busted leg from several years back, but it never healed up quite right. Hope there's slapjacks. The big dog cocked his head to one side. I could do with just a hot cup of coffee. Although the way Emmanuel makes it, it'll just burn up my insides. Catching some movement from the corner of his eye, Casey glanced up. Someone was heading his way, riding alongside the willows. That would be Edwin, taking his sweet time. He walked his horse, just ambling along. At one point, he angled away from the willows to get around to the beaver pond. The sound of hoofsteps in the crusty snow carried up the valley. It had been another bitter night. It was April in the Rockies, so that was no surprise. Casey shook his head impatiently. It was chilly and his night shift was over and all he wanted to do was ride into camp. So there we have uh, uh, some of the characters here are at their campfire. There's a uh, cowboys, there's a young kid, uh, there's a there's an old grizzled cook, and then there's a couple more seasoned guys who are leading, the, uh, leading up the, the, the whole herd. And so I'm trying to, in, in writing this story, to try and give uh, some different kinds of characters, try to give uh, 
like Casey, the character there, uh, you know, he's the stable good guy who's, uh, who's he's, he's been a cowhand or a cowboy for a long time. Then there's Edwin, the young guy who rides up. He's a teenager and like a lot of teens, he's trying to find himself, trying to be a man. So I kind of gave him some, uh, some rougher edges. So he's the kind of kid who's gonna try and talk back, to, uh, talk back to his elders, maybe cuss a little bit, you know, trying to, trying to get his uh, footing in the world. Uh, and then there's uh, the cook, Emmanuel. He's, uh, he's been around for a while. He's a, he's a black guy, and he knows he's, he, he could have been a cowhand if it wasn't for the color of his face, he says. So there's a sense of you know, like, uh, hist the historical elements of the, of the race uh, realities back then that's in there. And yet at the same time, he's welcoming among the guys. He, they, he loves them. They love him. Um, and when things get tough and there's some violence, you know, they, they all feel it uh, just, as, just as equal. And then the, uh, the posse, once they get going, the deputy sheriff and the sheriff at the beginning we meet uh, go after Bill and um, without giving too much away, you know, there is some violence there and, and then things kind of shake out as we go. So that's basically sipping whiskey. So if you're in the mood for like uh, getting to know some cowboys, getting to know some bad guys and seeing how things go, uh, this is definitely the book for you. And then uh, the second book uh, is called Hard to Quit. And um, this is set about five years later in 1892. And it follows uh, a couple of the cowboys uh, to, to a new chapter in their lives. And I did get a chance uh, when, I, when this was published, this just came out literally in about, I think, September. And I had found out uh, the, the publication date, you know, I was working with an editor. And, um, and this was just a smaller editor out in Pennsylvania. This isn't like a major, you know, a major publication in the sense that, you know, I didn't get a big, uh, you know, chunk of money up front or anything like that, and I have to do all my own publicity work. And so I decided, hey, I'm gonna go out to Colorado and I'm gonna film a book trailer. And I don't know if you guys have heard of a book trailer or even a concept of a book trailer, but it's, uh, it's been around for a little while and I think it's kind of picking up steam. And authors do a whole bunch of different things. I've seen different kinds of book trailers, different styles. Sometimes it's just someone in front of a camera talking like I am with about their book. Um, and I managed to actually uh, get some actors in Colorado, just some local independent actors, and bring them up to, uh, to where we were gonna shoot this thing. And we had a script that had pulled out uh, several scenes from the new book, and we got them dressed up, got some horses, all that kind of stuff, and we managed to shoot uh, what turned out to be a couple things. I did a, uh, a short film, which was about eight minutes long, and I sent that to some uh, film festivals, and I don't know if it'll get picked up or not, but at least it's out there. And it's also on YouTube and Vimeo. And I also did a, a three-minute book trailer, which is uh, just a short version of the uh, a clip from the film, basically, where there's a montage of the characters, and you get to see a lot more images that kind of leave you like wanting more, like, ooh, what's this about? I'm gonna get the book. So that's my book trailer. So I was gonna show you first a, a one-minute version of it, and that's the teaser trailer. And if you wanna roll that, April, it'd be great. I'll show you a little bit more here in a couple minutes. So that's kind of give you a little taste of what to look forward to. So Hard to Quit um, came about slowly, just like the first book did. I don't know if, I know there's at least one author in the room. And uh, if anyone else has tried your hand at writing, uh, depending on your genre, sometimes it comes easy and sometimes it comes slow. And for me, this was slow, but a lot of that was um, because I was trying to, you know, keep connected to that history. So I had like, I feel like every time I started a new chapter, it's like I'm gonna find something historical, something to base it in, or at least to spur on my imagination and, and, uh, and keep it authentic. Uh, so the first book, I think this took me, I wanna say three years from the concept, hey, I'm gonna write a book, to the actual publication. So it took a while of writing and uh, thinking characters up. And, and uh, for me, the writing process included 
rewrites. So I, like, I got to the end, and I went back, and I completely scrapped the first chapters and rewrote them completely. And then I went through, and I, you know, I, once I actually knew who my characters were a little bit stronger, I went back through and you know, fleshed them out a little bit better in the earlier chapters for the sake of consistency. And I think that really worked. Um, and then the same, same thing with uh, the second novel. I'm like, hey, I want to take these characters to a new place. Now, what historically is going to inspire me? Where would they go from, from the book here, where, say, they were in um, uh, Cattle Drive in northern Colorado? Here, they're in kind of southern Colorado. There's a town called Creed, which is a silver boom camp. So whereas this one was all about a cattle drive in the mountains, this is almost more about the mining communities, because there's a lot of mining history in the mountains, too. Um, so I had my cowboys in this book say, hey, we're going to take, uh, we're going to set up a, a cattle, a beef operation to feed a silver camp. So that was kind of the basic uh, concept here. And of course, in any, any boom camp in that time is a great deal of lawlessness. Uh, anytime there's men looking for money and there's no, there's no sheriff around, there's no rules, and as it was in the frontier days where there's gambling and there's nothing to do with your time but gamble, or drink, there's gonna be a lot of violence, and that's kind of what happened here. There was a, a real-life character, a guy named Soapy Smith. Um, I don't know if you've heard of him or not, but he was alive in the late 1800s, and he was a con man. He started in Denver uh, doing the soap con. So on the streets of Denver and in Leadville, uh, he would literally set up a table with bars of soap and paper, and he would uh, say, hey, everyone, come up here and look, and he goes, I'm gonna give you a chance to win some money, and he would wrap up a bar of soap with a $5 bill, and then you put some tissue paper around it and tie it off, and then you wrap up several bars of soap in the exact same manner with, with blue tissue paper and tie it off with twine. You make a pile out of it, and then you pull out maybe a $100 bill, and you wrap it up, and you put it in there, and then you'd say, hey, who wants to make, you know, who wants to come up here and make five, or pay me five bucks, and I'll let you pick out one bar of soap. So you may win the $100, you may win the five, or you may just walk out with a nickel bar of soap. And that was his con, and that's how he kind of got his notoriety, and then as time went on, he uh, developed new cons and basically became uh, really a gangster in his era. And it, at one point, he, he left Denver to go up to Creed, Colorado, because he found out, hey, here's this brand new silver boom camp. Denver's becoming too, too big. There's too much law, you know, even though there's a lot of corruption. And you know, he was getting kind of pushed around, and he had competition with other, um, uh, other con men who were there trying to get their piece of the pie, too. So he went up to Creed, this brand new silver camp. And he decided to take over the town and set up shop. And he brought his gang up, and that's exactly what he did. So that was, uh, that was the bad guy that I chose to use in this book, a real character who actually did this stuff. And I brought my fictional characters into the, into the storyline and wove it together. So I'll just read you the back of the book here. In a boom camp like Creed, most people want to get rich either mining silver or playing cards. LG and Davis have a different plan, sell beef. Fighting the bitter temperatures and the winter snows of the Colorado high country, they string wire and they bring in cattle, but things are more dangerous than the weather. Having run out of luck and run out of Denver, con man Soapy Smith brings his gang up to Creed to start over. His vision of success is different than everyone else's, and it involves rigging the odds in his favor no matter who it affects or how far he must reach. So that's where we're going with that, and that's where uh, we'll, we'll tie into the uh, film here in, a, in just a minute. Let me read you just uh, maybe a couple paragraphs out of this one, too. Give you an idea. Winter, 1892, Creed. Squinting in the darkness, Davis tried to see if LG's eyes were open. But his hat brim was too low and the light too dull. He resisted the urge to check his pocket watch. Davis didn't even want to know what time it was. The two of them were huddled around a cast iron stove with a big dent in it. The top of the firebox was so mashed in, the iron door did not close properly, properly, and hot embers kept rolling out every time the fire popped or shifted. Just to keep the tent warm, someone had to stay up and feed sticks every half hour or so. Davis was mad about the whole situation. Every night they drew cards to see who stayed up with it, and every night it seemed LG drew a high ace. Why couldn't they just alternate? If I ain't getting no sleep, then you ain't getting no sleep. He reached over and poked LG in the cheek but got no response. LG's arms were folded and his chin was resting on his chest. He appeared to be sound asleep, but Davis suspected he was just as awake as he was. Say, whatever happened to Emmanuel? He asked in a loud voice. That cook was one of the finest men that ever graced a chuck wagon. Top hand punching cattle, I'd add. 
he could fork any horse no matter how corrupt it was. They had a long day ahead and Davis was not looking forward to it. Building a cow camp in the middle of winter was a chore. Creed was a new boom town. Silver had just been found and people were flocking to the canyon to try their hand at mining. But LG and Davis had a different plan to get rich. Beef, the only meat source in the back country was deer, maybe a bear or fish from the half frozen river. People would pay high dollar for steak. So that's kind of where we're getting going here in the beginning. In, uh, in this one, the, uh, the characters uh, you meet here, Davis and LG, are a couple cowboys from the first book, so I am bringing them on, um, and you're getting to know them a little bit more in a different situation. So that's kind of been the fun of writing a, a sequel, as opposed to just saying, hey, I'm gonna start a whole new storyline with some whole new characters. I felt like I, hey, I had all these great characters that I put a lot of effort into getting to know and to fleshing out, and I wanted to like, see where they go. You know, what happens five years down the road? In this one too, the first book, I had a kid who was, uh, I think he was 10 years old in here, and we see him introduced. He's a young kid. He's just, uh, you know, one of the, uh, he's the son of, of the, the trail boss, and we just kind of get introduced to him here in the second half of the book. And I take him further in, in uh, the second book here, the sequel. He's now 15 years old, and he's his first, basically his first real job is gonna go be a cowboy and work for LG and Davis. So he's gonna be part of the cow crew here in Creed, and we're gonna see him as a, as a, as a man, as a young man trying to grow up and uh, learn how to do business uh, in, a, in a rough place. Uh, I did uh, try and get some book reviews. Uh, again, as, as I am my own publicist, sometimes it's hard to you know, get the word out, and anybody who's, who's written and, and tried, to, tried to get your, your books out there, it's not always that easy. So actually, this right here is fantastic. I really appreciate you guys coming out, because this, uh, this is the best way, I think, is just connecting people with people face-to-face, -face and uh, as opposed to getting sucked into that black hole we call the internet. Uh, it's, you can spend a lot of time there and not get a lot out of it, I can assure you. But on the other hand, um, you know, talking to people and, and connecting with people who actually enjoy Westerns, I think that's, I think that's the best way to do it. So uh, the books are here at the library, and um, feel free to check them out. I do have some up front here. If you uh, want to take a peek at them, you can. If you want to buy them, you can, any, anything you want. They, they're, right now they're retailing for like, uh, I think this one's around 15 and this one's around 20, but uh, if you wanted to buy one, if you want to donate anything, and uh, I'd be happy to give you a book and walk home with it today. Um, I do have the short film I was gonna show you, and I think we'll go ahead and jump into that now. Unless there's any questions, you guys have any thoughts or reactions or anything catch your, catching your eye? Ah, oh, yes, all right. Ooh, yeah, I think that would be great. Yeah, yeah, that would be fun. I would love to figure out how to get that uh, picked up. I actually have a friend who's a filmmaker who helped me with this, and he was he was trying to reach out to a financer in L.A., and we had actually written these up as scripts, and who knows, it may still happen, but it would be a low-budget thing if we did, but it's out there. We'll see what happens. Yeah. I read on your website that you were working in Colorado, too. Yeah. Were you writing there and in Minnesota, or did you just start writing these things in Minnesota? Both. Yeah, I did Sipping Whiskey in Colorado, and then when I moved here is when I started on Hard to Quit. So I, I, and it's definitely, for me, it's one way to keep connected with the West is writing and thinking about it, so I, I love that. Uh, maybe that's just part of the whole, the writing world anyways. You're always taking yourself somewhere uh, creative and interesting, and uh, that's part of it for me. But yeah, um, yeah, it never, it never really slowed down. It just came here and kept writing. And, now, and, and I'm really thankful that some of the libraries have been picking it up too. That's been part of my uh, public, pub, uh, publicist approach is to try and get uh, the books out in the libraries and, and connect with, with readers that way too. So, um, yeah, let's, let's watch the short film. It's, um, I don't know if we need to worry about volume or anything. I'm sure you guys will figure that out, but it's about eight, eight minutes long. So it's, it's got a couple scenes here you may recognize. I'm gonna grab a seat and here is Hard to Quit, the short film. If I ain't sleeping, you ain't sleeping. You remember Emanuel? That cook was the finest man ever graced a chuck wagon. 
top hand cow punching. And I'd add, he could fork a horse no matter how corrupt it was. You remember that time Emmanuel couldn't find his triangle? Sun's out. Right. Almost didn't want to wake you. You looked about as peaceful as the baby Jesus. No, hold on. We can't go anywhere till the coffee's been drunk. I simply refuse to throw out good coffee. Did you get your beauty rest? Pinheads? You were Duke of Durham, man, for the longest time. Only Dukes, you'd say. Only Dukes. What made you change your tune? Well, that's right. They plum quit making them. Mess your fancy shoes. I wish I had a pair of fancy shoes. What is it, Ed? What is it that is so blessed secretive I have to come all the way out here in a hailstorm? Look at you. Such a big man in town. Can barely afford a few moments for an old friend. Just tell me a damn message. Should I let it be a surprise? Surprises are more fun. Guys, get this finished before that weather gets ugly. Hope so too. What's this gonna be, anyhow? This could be a meat market. We're gonna sell beef here. Well, that's good. That'll make procuring beef for the club easy. I bet poor Bat wishes he had a beef supplier as faithful as you two. You'd be happy to know he does. Don't tell me you guys are selling beef to bat.
Yeah, so do um, you guys like that? Yeah, yeah, there is, yeah. <laughs> now I wish we could do a feature length, that'd be kind of fun. That kind of gives you a taste of what the book's about. There's some, so hopefully some mystery there, like, oh, what's going on there? I gotta know more, you know, and that's kind of the idea. Um, yeah, any more questions about Westerns, or about this book, or anything in general, or any? Um, that's a good question. At least in my experience, I know for, uh, I feel like the, the Western always keeps coming back. You know, sometimes there's highs and lows, and maybe you've experienced that too. Certainly in the movie world, right now there's some, there's been a couple Westerns that have popped out recently that are actually really good. I don't, there's a movie called Hostiles, Hostiles that came out recently. If you haven't seen it, that's really, I recommend it. Um, it was in theaters, I think, um, just about a month ago. I don't know if it's still out. But uh, that was uh, Christian Bale, and uh, it was set. Actually, they filmed that in New Mexico and a little bit in Colorado. Uh, Colorado's been closed to Hollywood for quite a while because of their film tax incentives have been way too high, just like Minnesota, actually. That's the reason Hollywood kind of got chased out of here, uh, as I understand it, maybe a decade or more ago, is because the, the, the legislation changed that was not so friendly towards Hollywood productions. Uh, but Colorado recently lowered their uh, tax rebates and, and lured in a few bigger budget uh, productions like Hostels, uh, so that's kind of cool. But I do think, um, I think there's always going to be a, a, a desire for it. I know on TV, there was that show um, Longmire that was on Netflix and AM, AMC, I think, I can't remember. But Longmire, there was Justified that came out that was based on the Elmore uh, Kelton book. That was pretty good. So I think there's always a, a, a desire for it. Because I think... Contemporary Western is what I call it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Did you see those? Yep. Yeah. What'd you guys think? No, I really liked them. Yeah. I did too. I thought it was pretty good. I haven't read any of uh, Craig Johnson's Longmire books yet. Has, has anybody in here read any of his books? My wife's read them all. She really likes them. Does she? Okay. I've got the first one in my Amazon cart. I'm like going to get it here pretty soon. But I watched the whole series and I thought it was pretty well done. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know, I feel like there's stuff like that. The themes of good and evil, you know, and good triumphing over evil, I think those are, 
that are evergreen, you know, especially in today's moral and morally ambiguous society these days. I think that's that's what brings us back. The idea that right and wrong is is real, good and bad. Uh, you know, good is real, and it's important to to be inspired by that. You know, I think it gives us hope. Plus, it's just imaginative. I think it's awesome. You know, kind of get your it's kind of like uh, Halloween for adults. You know, you get to get your mindset into a whole different character set and one foot in reality. You know, with the history, that's kind of fun for me too. But yeah. So, what do you think? Have you seen any uh, or read any westerns that you like right now? Um, no, I haven't really read. <laughs> yeah. I've got a lot of books that I've read recently, but they're um, mm. pretty Good. Yeah, well, I know uh, I'm a part of a group called the Western Writers of America, which is based out of, um, well, they have their office in, in Wyoming, and there's a lot of people who live out west. They're just dotted all over the country that they're a part of this group, and they're all people who've established writers, whether it's like me, who've just done a couple books, or people who've done a lot more. Um, you know, they're all part of this group. So I know there's a, there are people out there writing and trying to do it, you know, hold the, the genre up to a higher standard and try and do some good quality stuff. Um, and like Craig Johnson with the Long, the Longmire series, he's probably the biggest Western, contemporary Western author that I can think of right now. Um, so I, I know it's still out there, and I think it's, I think it's still relevant, and, and people like it. So we'll see what happens as time goes on. But I have a feeling it's just always going to be like this. Like there's some movies uh, that came out a few years ago, like Open Range with Kevin Costner, Robert Duvall. That was fantastic. Uh, that's you can get that off a of DVD or or download it easily these days. Um, has anyone, have you seen the, surely you've seen Lonesome Dove, the, the, ser the, the series, right, with Robert Duvall? Yeah, Open Range is awesome. Yeah. Oh, yes. One more time, that's right, yeah. Kevin Costner, he's actually doing a show right now, he's filming it called Yellowstone. I don't know if you heard of that. That's going to be coming out, I think, this summer, June, is what I heard la last on the Paramount Network, whatever that is, I don't know. I think it's their flagship uh, show. Hopefully we'll be able to see it, but the guy who wrote some of the more recent Western movies, like uh, there's one that came out called Wind River that was set in Wyoming recently. Um, and he's the same guy who wrote uh, kind of a Mexican border, more of a drug cop thing called Sicario that came out of, about a year ago. He's the same writer who wrote those, and he wrote this Yellowstone show, and he's directing it. Uh, oh, and Hell or High Water. He did Hell or High Water, which had uh, I think Jeff Bridges and um, Ben Foster, Chris Pine, a couple guys like that, so some Hollywood names, both the young guys and established guys. And that was more of a contemporary Western kind of a thing, too. So there's been a few recently that are, I think it's keeping the genre alive, at least in film. Um, uh, and I think the books are still kind of going, too. It's just not as, obviously not as high profile, so it's still going. Yeah, well, thanks for letting me uh, carry on for a while. Hopefully you're inspired to read some, some Western books, and feel free to come look or, uh, or check them out from the library here in the coming weeks. Um, I do have uh, a Facebook page, if you're into that. It's just facebook.com slash sipping whiskey in a shallow grave. So if you can find that, then you can probably find, I got links on there to my videos and, webs and website. Uh, I'm still trying to fix my website so you can actually find it, but the, at least it's on Facebook right now. And the films, both these things you saw tonight, are on Vimeo. So if you go to vimeo.com slash Mark Mitten, they're right there. And you can also look up YouTube. Um, I think I called them the Hard to Quit short, uh, or trailer, the book trailers, Hard to Quit book trailer. If you look that up on YouTube, you'll find them there too. Okay. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Is there anything?